Good afternoon. I just realized that I'm what's standing between you and whatever comes next. Well, I want, first of all, I want to thank Professor Gold and the Webb Institute for this opportunity to talk about something that has become important to me. Um, uh, if you if you are old enough, you can remember a world that was colder. Um, since 1950, sea level uh, sea level has risen considerably, and the frequency of coastal flooding in the New York metropolitan area has doubled. Um, and we are now looking at an industry that provides four percent of all the greenhouse gas emissions, more than commercial aviation. And we are looking at new design constraints, such as the Energy Efficient Design Index and the Energy Efficient Existing Vessel Index. All this sort of came to roost for me um, by accident. Um, first of all, I was doing an independent study with a student who was interested in military ship design. And we were looking at expeditionary logistics. Um, unlike underway replenishment or, uh, or, or combat or assault logistics, expeditionary logistics, according to the Navy document, um, says that it is the responsibility of the merchant marine. And that led us to a conversation where we went back and looked at the kinds of ships that the merchant marine used um, and during World War II. And the star of that show was a ship called EC2, which we know better as the Liberty ship. Uh, they built 2,710 of them. And at the same time, I received an email message from a friend, uh, Professor Kira Mendelson Mattis, who is a professor of um, she's, a, she's a sustainability economist. She, she teaches at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And she asked me, why are GHG discharges from shipping so much higher than aviation? Um, and at that point, I remembered some lectures that were given by Professor Philip Mandel when I was a graduate student at MIT. I've always thought Mandel was the best practical hydrodynamicist I ever met in my life. So I went back and I looked at some of the things that Mandel had uh, taught me. And, and I looked at some of the information about Liberty ships. Liberty ships are very, very simple. They were simple to build. They were, they were simple to operate. Amazingly little power. With 2,500 indicated horsepower, they had less power than you would find in a small to moderate sized tugboat nowadays. They could carry 11,000 tons of cargo, more or less. And, and, and although they were, uh, the, the claim was that they were built for a single wartime voyage. After the war, they became the backbone of the world's merchant marine for, for a decade. Um, and the thing that I noticed, and this is a number that kept recurring to the point where I had dreams, it, Liberty Ship had a fruit number of 0 0.15, and that 0 0.15 number kept coming up the more I looked around. Mandel had taught me about um, some uh, some basics of hydrodynamics. And one of the things he showed us was a, a, an invited paper for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers meeting in 1950, written by Gabrielle, Gabrielli and von Karman. And they invented a measure of, actually an inverse measure of efficiency for transportation called specific power. The lower the specific power, the higher the efficiency. And since William Froude devised the means to segregate elements of ship's resistance into viscous and wave making resistance, um, we have been given a choice. Every ship has to contend with viscous resistance. 
But to go fast means we are choosing to experience wave making resistance. So Gabrielli and von Karman in their work on, on transport efficiency looked at all sorts of vehicles. And what they found, this is from their original 1950 paper. What they found was there was a boundary that came to be known as the Gabrielli von Karman line. And even there have been some, this, the, these data have been revisited by the way, and the line has not been bent very much. It, it, it's still almost entirely intact. But the interesting thing you'll note is that the merchant ship is the single most efficient means of transport ever devised. In fact, the Liberty ship doesn't quite appear on this. If you follow the Gabrielli and von Karman line down further, extend it downwards uh, to roughly the intersection of 10 miles an hour and 0 0.002, the Liberty ship would lie on it just, just a little bit above the line. So here is my first answer. And I wrote back to, uh, uh, to Kira, Mattis, and I said, it's not that shipping is inefficient, it's that shipping carries 80% of world trade, therefore the GHG emissions are very high, but they're not high because we're not operating efficiently, we're operating more efficiently than virtually anything else in the world. And then the other, the other thing that comes to light here is as you stare at this for a while, you realize you can be fast or you can be efficient. It's really difficult to be both. There's no place here where you can be fast and efficient. And as Mandel kept pointing out, this, this lower quadrant, the Southeast quadrant of this, of this plot is not attainable. You can't go there. So this was a really interesting, um, a really interesting encounter for me uh, after so many years, and I want to note that the measure of specific power is the power divided by the velocity and by the weight of the of the vehicle. All right, power divided by velocity and divided by weight. And although it's not obvious, that was the derivation of the EEDI, right? If you look at the equation in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see power divided by dead weight divided by speed. And that differs only in terms of constants uh, with specific power. So specific power was the original objective of the EEDI, this is my inference, but clearly it got pretty complicated after that as it developed. So I thought about this for a while and, um, and it occurred to me that an, an, an approach to restricting greenhouse gas emissions might be simply to replace EEDI with a more effective uh, measure and what, what's, what's better than fruit number because fruit number would seem to be an intelligent limitation on speed, right? If wave making resistance is what causes ships to become inefficient, then by limiting fruit number, we can basically eliminate wave making resistance as a choice. And I am of the opinion that there is nothing we can do with respect to restricting greenhouse gas emissions that will not result in a change of our own behavior as well as a change in technology. And unfortunately, a purely technological change I do not think is going to be attainable. Turns out EEDI would be entirely consistent with the current design of bulk carriers and tankers. They basically operate exactly at a fruit number of about 0 0.14, 0 0.15. That magic number keeps coming up. It would have a big effect in the general cargo trades. Now the general cargo trades 
uh, did not develop in the same manner as the bulk trades. They tend to be less economically efficient. They were more fo focused on market choices. Yes, on choices that were made. So speeds of mainline container ships from the outset were, were based on uh, distances and how and frequency of sailing, uh, both in the North Pacific run and the North Atlantic run. But if you change the design of ships using a standard based on fruit number, speed is length. If we make ship, ships longer, we can make them faster. So fruit number provides, I think, a more intelligent standard for judging the efficiency of a vessel in, in, um, in trade. Yeah, there are some problems. Short ships, small ships uh, have a problem here. If, you're, if you have a ship below 100 or 150 meters, it might be difficult. But when you plot the curves of length between perpendiculars versus the speed that would be allowed if you impose a particular fruit number limit. And here I've plotted um, 0 0.14, 0 0.15, 0 0.16, and 0 0.17. You can see that ships, ships of a given length do not experience too bad of a speed reduction in comparison to what they currently operate at. I'm not talking about fuels. I'm not talking about the means of propulsion. I'm talking only about the efficiency of the hull, the ability of the hull to operate in a regime where little energy is required. Recently, I attended the paper presented by Lindstad and her co-authors at the SMC um, in Houston in last September. Uh, although their paper was primarily con concerned with wind assistant ship propulsion, um, they pointed out the benefits of hull slenderness um, and on improving efficiency. And one of the things they talked about that was particularly interesting was the concept of base speed. The speed before the, the curve of ship resistance starts to go upward approximately as a, as a, with, uh, proportionally to a cube of the speed because of wave making resistance. And they gave an expression for base speed and with a little, a little algebra, you can convert that into the idea of, of and I said base speed, it's boundary speed. Uh, you can convert that into an expression for boundary fruit number. It turns out that the, the fruit number can vary with the form of the ship, which is something that's been known for a long time, but, um, uh, I found this to be particularly interesting in that I think that it offers um, a way to come up with an even more intelligent standard for uh, limitation of speeds of ships uh, to reduce GHG emissions. <clears throat> so basically, the, the, the boundary fruit number is a linear, a linear uh, function of, of uh, Black coefficient, which suggests that there are ships that probably should be finer in form than they currently are in terms of their, their hull design. Um, and that by doing so, they would be able to achieve a lower fruit number as a boundary. And, uh, and therefore they would be able to increase speed efficiently for a given length. Anyway, as I proceed down this route, I thought about some things that it may imply. Um, first of all, in terms of existing ships, if efficiency improves with a reduction in speed, speed then slow down, but fruit number implies a more intelligent way of slowing down. That is, you can, if you make the, if you can design a ship to be longer, you can make it faster. If you have an existing ship, we have a mechanism for making it longer. We can jumbleize the ship. Um, fineness is something that has gone out of fashion, particularly in the bulk trades. Um, and um, reducing, reducing the block coefficient can result in um, um, much higher speeds uh, because it 
it increases the boundary crude number. Um, there, are, there are data that show that uh, uh, when, when ships have been slowed, typically for, uh, for reasons of cost or availability of fuel, that efficiency has gone up. That, uh, that, assert, that finding basically supports Gabrielli and von Karman's assertion that the price of speed is efficiency. Um, so a fruit limitation could be effective for, even for existing ships, but it's going to have economic consequences. And for general cargo trades, and, and Professor Mattis came back to me and she hit me pretty hard on this. She said, it's not enough to look at the ship in general cargo trades. You have to look at the entire supply chain. Um, that uh, depending, you can, you can manufacture you can manufacture things anywhere you like, but uh, if if the carbon um, discharge is greater, uh, even for landside transportation, you're achieving nothing. So it is necessary to look at the uh, the goods uh, in terms of their entire life cycle. So. I, I, I want to show you. Can we go backwards here? Yes. I found a really neat Latin phrase. I don't speak Latin. I do have Google Translate. Caveat exogitatoris. Loosely translated according to Google as let the designer beware. Um, it's an ex it, it's a well-known axiom of operations research that you cannot improve the uh, the objective function of a system by adding a constraint. As we add constraints uh, to achieve better greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to change the objective function. Changing the objective function is going to change behaviors. We should accept that upfront. That the regulation process here is also a process of changing the behavior of people who work in shipping and ship design. Lindstadt and her colleagues write of GHG evaluation in terms of well to wake, but Mattis talks about uh, GHG in terms of the product life cycle. If the product life cycle is in fact what we have to pay attention to, then the result could be more onshore manufacturing and fewer goods being shipped by sea. Um, the reductions in general cargo movements would be probably replaced by increased shipments of raw materials to move them to the manufacturing sites. Initial results uh, from GHG reduction efforts have proved promising according to some publications. Um, but as uh, if, if, if non-carbon based fuels do um, emerge, um, the results could be misleading um, because it could be that fuels are being diverted from more effective uses in other industries and other locations. Um, but most of all ship owners will object or will oppose or will invest in other opportunities because they are very sensitive to changes in OPEX and CAPEX. Um, I think a simple, a, a simple approach to regulating GHG is going to be more effective uh, because it's harder to, to oppose a simple standard than it is one that's very complicated as as EEDI has become. So I've come in here to talk about the ship and not the fuel. I've, um, I think there's a lot to be talked about here. And I think there's gonna be a difference of opinion. And I'm hoping that I learned something from it. So if I may, I invite you to have at me.
<laughs> Questions and comments in the audience? There are a couple also online. But well, well, the is working. I'm ready for a Yes, I know that. <laughs> um, I, I, you made this incredibly valid point. The low food number is the way to go. And as a matter of fact, the uh, uh, Gabriella from Carmel line has been brokered by super tankers and very large companies. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and I, I really like the idea of keeping it simple and constraints. You had a comment there about you said you cannot have a constraint and, and the great system. Is that correct? Is that my interpretation? Oh, yeah, that's that's the basis of a number of uh, uh, algorithms and operations. I find that interesting because, for example, very simply, if I say today hey, all cars need to be five feet wide, I know I can efficiency of the uh, car transportation system, probably by 300, 400 percent. And that's a single constraint. So the car is the same width, I have better area and on the highway, parking spots are much smaller, they have more evenly spaced, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So constraints, I'm not sure I understand that. Aren't you shaping the constraint? Hmm? Aren't you shaping the constraint? No, I'm adding it. You're saying I'm not saying cars need to be wide. No, all cars need to be five feet wide. And that is, if you make all cars five feet wide, the transportation system, all the cars in the world, all five feet wide, the efficiency goes way up. But isn't, isn't there an implicit constraint today about how big the cars are? The yeah, but basically, we're building parking spots for the widest park. So we now have parking spots off the five feet wide. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. right. Yeah, so I so and then I'll, I'll let you ask I think I'm challenging that you're adding constraint versus the implicit constraint that leads to all of the cars design being a certain way today that you would probably be going to constraint why is it five for today? What do you think is true? What I'm saying is true, I'm just simply saying that you're changing the system but adding constraint to get high efficiency. But that it doesn't exist is simply because it's made it has chaos in the AI order. We're the same way that container, shipping container, we need to build all system efficiency, even though shipping container is not necessarily the optimal size, could be constrained. So anyway, that was my comment. And I'm not sure so I, 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 I can certainly give you a reference to the uh, uh, but are they more? <laughs> I, I can certainly give you a reference to the uh, Adding a constraint thing. That's the cool. comment is that if you go to uh, you say let's go more slender, and I love slender, but slender reduces cargo carrying capacity very rapidly. So if you go more slender, you actually your cost of moving a ton of cargo goes up, right? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Going slender has a number of uh, if you go slender but longer. Right, you could uh, you could conceivably have the same cargo capacity, but now other things become right. limitations right. like stability. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, the, the, and then there's also wet surface factor. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a lot of the transition today kind of gets hindered by the economic you know, reality, uh, and everything making sense. Yeah. Have you given any thought to you know, speed as is usually used as kind of like a hack factor of like, hey, we can play with that if we run to play, right? It's kind of like a, a, a black box lever that you can um, you can really push and that really helps the, the whole economical part. Taking that out, like, have you given any thought how that would influence that kind of balance of the thinking? Taking, let, let me meet, make sure I understand your question. You're suggesting we take speed out? So if you know what I mean is today, ships can be designed at a certain speed, but just putting like increasing the speed for whatever reason really helps us, you know, be more competitive, get to certain times, even though that's very inefficient. But since there's no cost to that today, like that's a big like buffer that, right. that we have. If we go to something like Lift, where that becomes a fixed thing that you can't use anymore, well, it, it, how do you think that will impact? Well, if there's a limitation, for instance, on food number, and maybe food number is is uh, determined on the basis of the boundary food number instead of just a flat out, this is a magic food number, you, you shall never go above it. But if it's if there's a limitation based on food number, 
I could foresee that being uh, imp uh, imposed several ways. Uh, number one is, well, what if we're burning entirely non-carbon fuels or using some al alternative method of propulsion that does not generate PHG? Would we have exceptions, right? That, for instance, would change behaviors uh, because now in terms of ship operation, we'd have to look at those other things using wind-assisted uh, ship propulsion, using non-carbon-based fuels, um, uh, or perhaps something we haven't thought about yet. That's number one. Number two is if you if you said, okay, you can burn any fuel you want, but you're going to pay a tax if you go over this fruit number, All right? If by by imposing a fruit limitation, a fruit number limitation on the ship, uh, would we in fact be reducing total GHG output for the worldwide fleet? And that's a question we'd have to think about. Uh, and I'm, at this point, I don't have the resources to, to do an estimate of that. That's kind of the next issue for me to address. My gut tells me correct. Right. Well, I'm my gut tells me that too, but uh, the number <laughs> of times my gut has been wrong is uh, <laughs> fairly well documented. Um, um, but I, uh, uh, so it, it could be imposed in the sense that this is a limit that shall not go beyond, or this is a limit beyond which you start paying some kind of a tax. Um, um, but the fact is having a, having a standard that doesn't change behavior changes nothing at all. Yes. I, I, I love your comment about the bulk fleet is pretty much running in the 0.15 group number, which is inherently efficient. And the interesting thing is that the main, main uh, cargo is actually at this stage a horribly inefficient mix of different cargo. Some cargo you do want to move fast, and the other cargo simply gets dumped on the ship. It gets run with all right. rags and scrap paper and grains and all kinds of things. It gets moved very fast on a fast running container ship simply because it's easy. And um, I think we should start looking at a split in the containerization trade too, you know, fast containers, both things like that. Well, and to a certain extent, I think that what we've seen in terms of the design of container ships over the last decade or so, um, the, the 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 response of of the of the ship owners to inefficiency has been to jumbleize the ships. Yes. Length of speed. So they effectively, by making the ships bigger, they have made the ships somewhat more efficient. But it makes the door to door delivery less efficient. Which is, ships which is what, it, and that's precisely what Professor Mattis has been telling me. Yes, that's right. You have to have a big full container ship. Have I? I, I, I actually uh, <laughs> in cargo. I had a discussion. Said, well, how how much grain are we shipping? Containers to cargo. Say we love to do it. The biggest problem we have. So I was getting empty containers to do it. Yeah. To, to, to the West. And uh, the interesting point you're making actually is that there's very large container ship here right now. We fill them all with grain containers and we run them slow. We actually have very efficient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we did have to fill our grain containers through all time. We did, I might say. It right. actually was an end phase, a very efficient system. And as a matter of fact, the good point is that revisiting all technologies that are inherently efficient. Wind, for example, is a is a, is a, is a really valid point. And I think last, if you look at the if you were to look at the uh, carbon footprint of lash in certain trades, might be incredible. And uh, you don't think we know what I'm talking about? Have I annoyed anyone else? Is there a company oh, that's oh, behind? Uh, one comment I did more similarly to Brett, I think Rick uh, Nick Ratnoff uh, was asking, how does this mechanism account for part of the carrying capacity? Uh, there's a real focus on finding find this improved risk impinging capacity, which could actually increase the energy and greenhouse gas intensity for the cargo. So I think you, in some you, you in some ways, answered that one already. Uh, and then the other one we have uh, Jeff Upmark, your you raised your hands. So I will allow you to talk. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Your question. Um, Professor Burke, uh, thank you one for a very interesting presentation. I assume you've been listening to all the other presentations uh, today, and it seems to me that uh, a recurring theme is that 
economy of scale is no longer as uh, uh, valid as one of the primary drivers of a ship design as it once was. Uh, and I would like to ask if you concur with that or if I've just interpreted that the way that I think it is. Uh, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, if you remember the largest tanker ever designed and built in the world, it was called the Seawise Giant. It was 660,000 deadweight tons. It, did, it was in service for less than 10 years, and no one ever came close to building a ship, a tanker that large again. I think we have repeatedly tested the boundaries of economy of scale. We've done it with tankers. Uh, we've done it with some in, in some other ways, on some other dimensions with other ships or ship types. And I think we're doing it right now in the general cargo uh, uh, area. Um, I think we will find the limitations of um, economies of scale. We've already found some in terms of uh, depths of major ports. There's, there's been dredging going on everywhere because of large container ships. Um, and I think this might, in fact, be a boundary for the uh, economies of scale in general cargo shipping, in, in containerized shipping. Um, um, so I think that your observation about economies of scale uh, is well taken. Uh, unfortunately, I apologize. I wasn't here for some of the earlier sessions because uh, I had students who needed teaching. And so I did my duty. It, it is interesting that uh, Eric faced the example of the A380 is an economy scale problem that certainly didn't work out, even though they were aerospace, which I have seen. <laughs> Anyone else? No, I, I, I'd like to, if we have time, I'd like to push the ball further, though. Uh, it seems to me that setting a food number, if we go to IMO and set a food number restriction right now, so you can't steam faster than 0.15. Uh, we really have a big game right away. It also provides a new appreciation right away for wind, because wind, of course, is below crude number and air, and below crude number propulsion. So there's some really interesting theory on there. There, it, it, yes, that, I mean, if, if someone were to make one of us emperor of the world, we could do that. <laughs> um, aside from the fact that that's a highly unlikely event. The funny thing is, having designed sailboats, the rules, when I first saw him in the eye, the first thing I tried to think about is how to achieve it. And it's achievable uh, in, in many different ways, but it was hard to achieve. I, like yeah. I, th I think, in that respect, the simplicity of the standard uh, has, in it, has intrinsic value. Yes. But it doesn't have to be an absolute standard. In fact, if you were saying before, you could very quickly evolve into a dual cargo system. Yes. Whereas you do have a really green. So some kind of economic advantage of heavy loads, but then you still have a high end for ships. You know, we're still shipping roses from there as well by airplane to the US and say winter. And you know, likewise, if people really, really, really need to have their high speed delivery to help with that on a, a boat that boat trip. But if they really don't care. To get it for a month, then put it on the move future. The, the, there is an interesting aspect to say we did a very element carbon line, we don't pay taxes. Yeah, don't see like that. Yeah. We pay taxes. And, and, and even just voluntarily look at Amazon now. You know, they're specifically saying we can deliver this stuff as it's ready, or if you want to wait five days, we can deliver it all at once. Clearly, they're going to save money in the holiday. But if you think about it, it's better to say we've got the same conversation. And if, in fact, you're going to pay a penalty for for uh, high speed, yeah. uh, that is inefficiency, then it gets added to the price of something that yeah. someone considers to be a cent. And interesting to use flow of steam, but you don't have to do intermediate ports of the future any shipping and go directly to that one particular port. It's not actually going to be really far worse. Online again, uh, Jamie Greenleaf, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. One of the things that I've been been interested in is we, had, we today we sort of had two different perspectives. Yours, which is 
if you will, very much based on the physics, the, the actual physics of the vessels, which I think was uh, very, very appropriate. The other part of it we're looking at it is we looked at um, different types of fuels. We looked at different types of uh, propulsion. What I'm wondering is whether or not we're actually eventually getting going to reach a point where on a global basis, we have to look at the optimization of our entire transportation system as well as any other systems. Now, I realize that, that, that this is a very, very big leap where we have to move away from uh, not national sovereignty and the rest of it. But do you see that there's going to be any time, and it's probably not the near future, but how far out in the future we're going to have to actually make a global response to this, a true global response to this, and take the inefficiencies out of all the systems that we have? Well, um, I thought EEDI was in effect of the, an early attempt to do precisely that. I thought it was an attempt to impose upon the ship design and ship operating community a global standard by which we would all have to live. Um, and um, I, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not advocating politically for for anything here in terms of uh, um, uh, who who retains sovereignty and who can impose uh, standards. But I, I think if if IMO is going to impose a standard that's intended to reduce GHG emission, emissions, that it ought to be one that is going to be effective and, um, um, and, and essentially simple for all of us to understand and use. Did I answer your question? Nothing else online. Anyone else have comments or questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just interested in what you see the path for us is become a reality. Like, where are you on that path? Um, academic exercise, or are you trying to do more? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I I uh, I. I sat around in my study and thought about this and crunched some numbers and came up with this. And I made a, I, I presented a kind of a white paper and a somewhat like this presentation uh, to my colleagues at the college uh, and got their, their viewpoint. Um, so this is my public debut of these ideas. So it really depends upon you. Um, the, uh, um, not one of you has thrown a tomato yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm 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 really trying to figure out for myself whether this is something that's uh, worth further development. In the sense that it is, it it seems to resonate with at least some people that this may be a more effective way at, of looking at things than the what we've taken in the past. Uh, and if that's the case, I'd like to work on it some more and see what the consequences would be. I think one thing to do right now is to say, well, if we impose certain kinds of crude limitations on ships, what would be the consequence in terms of the overall um, emissions of GHG from shipping? I think with that, with those numbers estimated, we would be able to be more intelligent about this discussion. And right now, I don't have those numbers. That's next year's presentation. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Professor, uh, I'm not quite sure if this is a maritime duty thesis, but I would suspect that if you would, you know, if they saw this presentation in the recording, if anyone was interested, they could do some of the late work. Yeah. To get that moving. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I've inflicted a version of this on my students already, no. <laughs> um, and um, I'm truly. I'm. I'm. I'm looking for a couple of students who want to do uh, independent research on this because I think it would be something really interesting to figure out. It might be, and, I'm, and I give this to you. Yeah. Uh, it might be something that a web student might like to do for a thesis. Yeah. In which case, I'd be happy to uh, try chime in. Uh, 
please let it include the door to door, door to door uh, evaluation rather than port support. Because port support is a little bit of a. Yeah, port support is a. <laughs> a little dicey. Yeah. Um, yes. I, uh, I, I, I touched on the economy of scale in the representative assets. You also the gold gray and other ships that are became so massive that they, you know, imploded mm -hmm. into the south and they design design room. And um, thinking back to the early presentation that you may not have seen that talked to me about uh, you know the, the heat management thinking about the economy of scale of having more medium-sized ships that uh, are limited by crew number that are able to deliver efficiently from door to door from port to port that I really think that at this point it's a simple you know, broad sweeping um, legislation change that I'm all over for the crew number of leaders at this point. Well economies of scale um plays into this certainly, but I think it has to play into it in an intelligent way. Uh, I, I, I have a suspicion that uh, uh, too many people have thought by simply making things bigger, we make everything better. And I'm not sure, I'm, I, I just don't buy into that. His, no, history that, does not support you know, that. that. Let's make the biggest attention so that we can get all the packages in China as well that was now two years too late, now 24,000 to you ship that right. not 24,000. Right. So, and, and similarly, like now we're, I think, tough and saying, you know, things are getting less volatile because, and, and then because we learn from those mistakes, hopefully, that we don't need the 8,000 on the market. And I, and I think I read in Lloyd's list yesterday or the day before about a record number of box ships being in layout. Um, yeah, and a record number of box ships being built. Yeah. Built. Yeah, so we seem to be pushing at both ends or yeah. pulling at both ends. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? I'm just going to say on the same kind of thing, the economy of scale seems to be driven by the last 30, 40 years of shipping from China to the US. Those trends are not necessarily going to go forward. We're trying to change the port of New York. To accommodate ships built for China, uh, when it doesn't really fit in New York, uh, what's your sense in terms of, you know, how does the port design and port constraints play into that economies of scale uh, equation? Well, I think in, in, in the end, those are the things that did in Sea Wife Giant. Sea Wife Giant couldn't, there were too many places they could, could not call at, and they were starting to hit the limitations of navigation in, uh, you know, common. Uh, common sea lanes. So I think we can we can take anything to a ridiculous limit. Um, but does it really improve uh, the effectiveness of what we're doing is the issue. And I think, uh, you know, that's certainly an open question with respect to, to uh, general cargo shipping. Um, you know, we, we have to make choices here. Do we ship roses? You know, do we do we ship uh, do we ship things that can be easily manufactured in other places that are more efficient in terms of um, uh, transportation and GHG uh, emissions? Um, the in New York, New Jersey, so in kind of those discussions with the folks like yourself, or they just um, I know some people there. <laughs> uh, I think they're still talking to me. But uh, they, their objectives are not my objectives. The Mississippi thing is just not just the fact that the Port of New York is making investments, but over four years, the U.S. are making investments. The same thing with each other, right? It's like the same thing with the A3A. Airports increased their jetways and public jetways and all kinds of things in the port. Where anybody with a screen is saying, it doesn't actually work. You know? <laughs> so, in, in, and no one should be going to show you anymore. <laughs> So who wants to go to New York with you know any day you are checking the information? Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.